baby she gets right there. All right, let's just go ahead. We're going to pray real quick, and then we're going to we're going to go ahead and just actually we're just going to read the whole chapter one, okay, just to get a kind of an idea of the overall context of the chapter, and then we'll go backwards and we'll we'll start breaking it down. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come into your house tonight. We're going to read your word, Lord. We thank you for the word that you've given us, and we pray, Lord, that you would open it up for us and that you'd give us understanding and wisdom. Lord, we thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding of God. We pray that you would supernaturally open up our eyes, open up our ears, and prepare our heart to receive your truth, oh Lord God, and what you desire for us to see. Lord, I pray that you'd move me out of the way and that you would flow through me the way that you desire to flow through me and that you would allow your people called by your name to have understanding, Lord, that they would be able to receive the communication that you speak to them tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's read. We're starting Daniel tonight. Amen. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. <laughs> In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spoke unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and unto Hananiah, Shadrach, and Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking, or look, the idea there is looking, worse looking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me, and just real quick right there, before we keep reading, I just want you to understand what, just, what was just said there. If I do what you're asking me to do, my concern is that the other children that come from your same place where you came from are going to look better than what you're going to look. Because, see, the food that he wants to give you and the wine he wants to give you to drink, is the purpose is to fatten you up and make you look real pretty. And if I do what you're asking me to do, you're going to look less. You're going to look gaunt. You're going to look dried up. You're going to look withered. You're going to look weaker than the other people that came over from where you came from. That's the main point I want you to see right there, okay? Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse, which is another word for vegetables. We'll just go ahead and you can't see it and I can't like blow it up because my pen's acting up right now. But put the word pulse there is vegetables, okay? To eat and water to drink. Now, this isn't in my notes, but you know, everybody does this Daniel fast now. And they got churches all across the land doing Daniel fast. And listen, I'm not over here to pick on anybody. Vegetables are probably more healthy for us, especially if they're organic, than eating meat. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that sometimes we can get caught up in some things that we can gain some benefit from. Because we could probably gain some benefit if we ate more vegetables and less, and less certain of meats. But at the same time, if we're so focused on a Daniel fast of eating vegetables and all this organic food, we're missing the spiritual 
food that the Lord's wanting to feed us in this passage of Scripture so that we can see what God's trying to show us. Amen? So there's all kinds of things that go on. Anybody remember that Daniel fast? Y'all remember that? What was that, about seven years ago? You know, and I'm just saying, there's always something new. Always something new. But Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And then the church always has some new thing that they're running after and that they're trying. Okay, and that was just the point I wanted to make. He says, then let our countenances be looked upon before you and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. As you see, deal with your servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. This isn't in my notes, but I want to make one point about this also. The way that God works is supernatural. We got to understand that. Listen, I'm not telling you to leave all your practical and logical faculties at your house and, and not to carry those around with you. That's not what I'm telling you to do. Because God's given you a brain so that you can think. As a matter of fact, I would prefer Christians that come to this church to be thinkers. But I do want you to understand and I want you to be able to believe that the God that you serve is a supernatural God. And he transcends natural boundaries. There's nothing that's impossible for him. And this is a classic example right here that these men, these young boys did not want to eat what everyone else was eating. And he said, why don't you put us to the test? And whenever they did, what happened was, was that they actually looked fuller and they looked better. Their countenance was more bright than the other ones around them that had eaten the king's food. And it didn't make any sense. And that's the main point I wanted to make with that right there. You and I need to start getting to the point where we understand that sometimes the way God chooses to do things right. doesn't make sense that's to right. the logical that's mind. That's right. Come on. Amen. Because, I mean, you could be in a situation, and I'm just going to use this as an example, where somebody does you wrong. The logical sense of the way to handle things is that you get your vengeance or you get retaliation. And many times there's, there's a, there, you have a right to your day in court, per se. But, but the Lord, and according to his word, and I'm and listen, every situation is different. you got to be led by the Spirit. All right? But the, I can give you so many examples, if I could spit them out to you real quick, of the Lord showing us that if we would be humble, if we would humble ourselves and trust him and surrender to his ways, if we would believe that, let, that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And if we would pray for our enemies and pray for those that despitefully use us, that's a hard thing to do. But what I'm trying to say is the God we serve is supernatural. Right. And he will fix things and move circumstances around in ways in our life. It doesn't always happen the way we want it to. It doesn't always happen according to the timing that we want it to. But nevertheless, are you going to serve him or not, no matter whether you get what it is that you're looking for? That's another thing. Amen? All right. So I wanted you to see that. It didn't make any sense. How are they going to be fatter? eating vegetables when everybody else is eating fatty meat, you know, probably pork. The children of Israel weren't allowed to eat pork. Pork has a lot of fat. Fat puts the meat on your bone. But how it happened, I don't know, but the Word of God says right here that they looked more full. Their countenance looked better than the other children around them for meat and vegetables. All the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. He said, if it weren't for them, we're going to give it to you too. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year. Of King Cyrus. Now I'm going to go back all the way up to the top to verse 1. And as I'm doing that, I just want to make the point that if you do the math of when Cyrus was the king and you imagine that Daniel was a teenager, and there's various reasons for us to believe that, about 16, 17 years old maybe, that 
in the, in the time frame that would have happened that Daniel would have been about 85 years old. So from about the age of 16 until 85, Daniel lived his life in a foreign land. Now, just real quick with the book of Daniel, let me just give us a little context because we're going to just take our time as we move through Daniel. We're not going to try to hurry. We're going to try to extract every piece of juice we can get out of it. One of the things that I want you to know, though, is, is that when we consider the history of the people of Israel, we talk about that a lot, do we not? We talk about the fact that there was no nation called Israel and that God called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees, which was ancient Babylon. And he said, listen, I'm going to make you a great nation. And I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. Anyway, through Abraham, he had some sons. And those 12 sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and we've recently talked about that a couple of times, those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. And through the 12 tribes of Israel, after the Egyptian exodus, God, after the wilderness wandering, God brought them finally into the land of Canaan, which we've done some study in, and I've drawn maps for you, and we've talked about that recently. That's why I do all that, so that we know what we're talking about once we get there, right? And so God brought the children of Israel into the promised land, which was originally called Canaan, which we know as Israel today. And during that time frame, when they finally went in, they, they, they went in under Joshua, but then there was a time frame known as the Judges. 400 years of the judges. Then from the judges, we went into the time frame of the kings. Okay, and the kings lasted all the way until we go into something called the intertestamental period. I want to say that one more time. The intertestamental period. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the time frame between Malachi and Matthew, where we say there was no prophetic voice from the time of Malachi to Matthew, but Daniel actually prophesies about that intertestamental period. And when we get to it, we'll talk about it. But there was no voice of prophecy per, per se for the children of Israel because Daniel actually prophesied about it before it ever happened. But he mentions that time frame. And a lot happened in the history of the Jews, but it's not written in the Bible. You, there's other documents that we can extract that information from. I'm just trying to let you know that there's a lot that took place in that intertestamental period. And when we get to that part, I'll try to bring some of that up so that we can be a little bit more familiar. But what I wanted to tell you is during the time frame of the king, starting with Solomon, and I've mentioned this recently, the children of Israel fell into the sin of idolatry. They started to worship foreign gods. Now, you got to always understand that whenever the people of God worship foreign gods and, and they engage in idolatry, it's, there's something else going on behind the scenes. And what I mean by that is, if you look at a statue or you look at an idol, that is just a physical representation of something that's much more sinister, much more, much more um, something that God is, is, is very upset about, and, but it's bigger than just something that's made out of wood or silver, or gold, or, or whatever the case, this thing represents something else. And what it represents is all that stuff that we spend all that time talking about. It's like, oh Lord, another, another message on the Nephilim, another message on territorial spirits. And yes, because we got to get it in our mind and understand the world that they live in, the world that we live in. And we have to understand that it's, God's not worried about a piece of wood. He doesn't want us putting our eyes and our focus on that, but what that represents, that the world that we live in, that there's a spiritual realm that's filled with fallen angels, filled with various types of demonic spirits, filled with all of this, and that the forces of evil are moving and operating in a spiritual realm, trying to cause confusion in God's people, trying to turn them away from the Lord. And, and, and in addition to that, we also recently talked about, and it's important that we understand it, that the Gentile nations have been under the influence of fallen angels. I, we talked about the prince of Persia, the prince of Grecia. We'll get into that again in Daniel chapter 10. But last time I talked to you about the prince of Tyre and the prince of, of Babylon and Isaiah and in Ezekiel. And how it starts off talking about a literal king or prince. But then the, the story changes and you know it's not talking about a human being anymore. It's talking about a fallen entity. That's the power source behind the king or the prince. And in both of those cases, it's really describing 
Lucifer, who we know as Satan, who's the deceiver and the antagonist of God. Now, it's important that we understand all this because the children of Israel during the time frame of the kings worshipped idols, worshipped false gods, worshipped, they were deceived into worshipping these false gods. And there's a whole lot that we could talk about in our own lives today where the enemy wants to get us off track and he wants to cause us to put our eyes on something other than the Lord. Okay, but we're, we're just going to we're just going to leave it at that. Right now. And those would be false gods. And that would be us in a certain way cheating on the Lord. Right. Okay, putting something before God. <laughs> and so the end result of that, because they they rebelled against God and they worshiped false gods, was that God allowed them to go under captivity. Right. Now, many of you already know that because you've studied the Bible. And some of you and many of you already know, because how many times have I said that through the last six years if you've been with us? But if you didn't know it, before long, you're going to know it. The history of the children of Israel is that in about 722 B.C., the kingdom of Assyria uh, came down from the north and took the northern part of Israel back away and, and brought them under bondage and enslaved them to their country. All right, just, I just want you to know that. The lower part of Israel, you remember I told you a while back, about three weeks ago, I told you that the kingdom was split in two. The northern ten tribes, the two lower southern tribes, which was Judah, which was made up of Benjamin and Judah. 546, somewhere around that number, B.C., Nebuchadnezzar shows up in Jerusalem. That's what we just read. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, shows up in Jerusalem somewhere around 536, 546 B.C. And the, what we're told through the word of God is that the reason that God, God orchestrated this event. And what you and I need to understand is in our own lives, sometimes there's things going on and we don't understand why it's happening. The Lord is orchestrating and allowing things to take place in order to get our attention. And when it's all, and God does that on a grand scale. And when it's all said and done, God's will is going to be done. How many times have I quoted Romans 8 and 28 this, this, tonight? That God causes all things to work together for good to those that love the Lord. If you're the child of God, if you're known of God, if you love him, sometimes there's going to be bad things that are going to happen. But God never wastes anything. And he knows exactly what you and I need in the mixture to get us to the place where he wants us to be. So whether it's on a macro scale worldwide or a micro scale in the child, the individual life of the believer, God allows sometimes the enemy to have a little leeway. And we see that in the book of Job. We don't have time to get into it, but I'm just saying there's scriptural precedence for that. That God allows it to happen because he wants to get our attention and he's testing us and he's allowing us the opportunity to serve him. And that's really been pounding in my mind lately. What does it mean to serve the Lord? And, and I mean, I'm just saying because I don't know that everybody sees it the way that I do. And I mean, I'm trying to get my information from the Bible. I'm not. But what I'm trying to say is I want to encourage you to seek that answer for yourself out of the word of God and through the spirit of God. What does it mean to serve the Lord? What does it look like for me to be a child of God? You know, in other words, if I meet somebody from another church somewhere and they just seem different. And it's like what their preacher's telling them sounds different than what your preacher's telling you. Now you got a conundrum. You got a complication. You got a situation. Now I got to find out what does it mean to serve the Lord? Is it what that preacher's saying? Is it what my preacher's saying? Is it what your preacher's saying? Why is there a conflict? Why is there a difference between the two? Who's got the right definition? That's got to be for each and every one of us. As in, I'm just here to read the word of God to you in this dissect. To me, a big part of serving the Lord is to be different than the world around us. God has called his people into his marvelous light. He's called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he's asked us to be separated, to be made holy, to be sanctified, so that we would look different and talk different and act different than the world around us. He did not say, I'm going to take you out of the world. Right. Jesus even prayed. That. John right. chapter 17. Right. I'm not asking you to take right. them out of the world. Right. No. I'm asking you to keep them from the evil one. Right. That you would use them. That they would be a testimony. Right. Amen. Right. God wants your life to be a testimony. So the children of Israel worship false gods. And because of that, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. And that's what we just read. 
We just read that. And so that's the context. Now, one of the big things I want you to know about the book of Daniel is that it's very apocalyptic in nature. The word apocalypse, I didn't do it. I always don't do it, but it's okay. I got something I can do it with. Sorry, drummer. I will put this back up there later. I don't expect anybody else to do it, but it's for the purpose of an illustration. All right? The word apocalypse in the Greek language. We're going to cover this up. Y'all are so, no, y'all see it? No, y'all see this, right? It's not like you're looking through the TV screen, right? <laughs> All right. The word apocalypse describes an unveiling. That's where we get the word revelation from. The book of Revelation, the literal word apocalypse, translated as revelation, means an unveiling. And it doesn't happen all the time. See, until the seals are broken, until seal number one in Revelation is broken, we're, we're, we're trying hard, my friend. And the Holy Spirit, I know I'm trying hard. I'm trying hard, dude. I'm digging and I'm dissecting and I'm underlining and highlighting and reading and watching somebody else. And, but guess what? Till the seals are broken, if somebody comes around here and tells you this is exactly how it's going to be, listen, you better be careful. I'm just warning you right now. But every day that goes by, and a little bit more that happens, the, and a little bit of time that goes by, and new things that happen, the Lord's slowly pulling back the curtain. Yeah. He's pulling it back and he's revealing. Ultimately, what the book of Revelation is saying is that, you know what's going to be revealed? Jesus is going to be revealed. Amen. One day, there ain't going to be no more confusion, my friend. All them people out there that didn't receive Christ through faith, they're going to know. Because it's going to be clear to the human eye. And guess what? Each and every day as you and I begin to learn and begin to study and begin to have more understanding and revelation about the word of God, the Lord is slowly but surely revealing the truth of what is going on. And through the book of Daniel, uh, through a, the book of Daniel is an Old Testament book that is full of apocalyptic literature. Now, the first six chapters are very narrative. The one we just read was narrative. You know what a narrative is, right? It tells a story when you got to narrate. And the angels in heaven sang and said, <laughs> peace be, un pe you know, goodwill to man and peace be on earth. That's a narration. That's the angels are telling a story. Or whenever a story is being told, you get it, a narrator tells a narrative, a story. The first six chapters in the book of Daniel are very narrative in nature, but the last six become apocalyptic. What does apocalyptic mean? It's full of symbols. It's full of signs. There's visions, there's symbols, and one thing means something else. And in order to properly break down apocalyptic literature, you have to go to correlating passages of Scripture. You have to go and you have to compare. And sometimes you find things in other Old Testament books. Sometimes you find things in New Testament books. Fortunately, in the book of Daniel, a lot of Daniel interprets itself. He, it, with time, as we keep reading, he'll give us interpretation. He'll right. say, oh, well, this, this is what this animal means. This animal represents Greek. Because right. on the front end, like next next chapter, the, mm -hmm. next week when we come here, you'll be like, how are you going to sit here and say that this is that and that is that? You're just making stuff up. Well, no, it's because there's other right. correlating right. places where we, where we see these things, right? So that's how the book of Daniel is uh is broken down so the theme of the book of daniel i want you to know this is regarding god's judgment on human governments more specifically what we've been talking about is the beast system now you might not have realized this but last week whenever i ended with revelation 17 when we were talking about the spirit of jezebel and i ended up in revelation 17 and i told you about that harlot that was riding that beast you might not have paid attention or i might not have said it but there was a seven-headed beast with ten horns okay and all this other imagery that's going on that's apocalyptic that's apocalyptic literature and the harlot she rep i'm telling you what she represents and we're going to break it down when we get there but you're just going to have to take it from me that's the beast system that's a mixture of of occultic religion with go with human governments that have been tied together for thousands of years and have been, if you could imagine it like this, this is how the Lord gave it to me for my book, galloping through the annals of human history. If you could imagine in your mind a chronology, 2000 BC, 1500 BC, 500 BC, 0 AD, 33 and a half 
A.D., theoretically, the cross. 65 A.D., the Apostle Paul writing the book of Galatians. 95 A.D., John writing the book of Revelation. And then now, 2021. And, and, and all of the things that are happening through the ages, all the wars and the rumors of wars and all the rise and falls of empire. And this beast has been just galloping. But it's called Mystery Babylon. The beast system is called Mystery Babylon because you can't see it. It's hidden behind the scenes. And who in the world would even believe it? You know, some of this stuff. That's why I wanted y'all to watch that video, that five-hour video. I don't know if you watched it or not, but I was trying to make a point. I wanted you to see the hidden hand, the occultic nature of the beast system of mystery religions and how it's hidden behind the scenes because this is the Bible is full of this. And we need to understand the context of what God is wanting to reveal to us so that, we, so that we can see it. So the book of Daniel, ultimately, listen, we're seeing God judging human government. Because I could sit here and list off a bunch of scriptures to you. Psalm chapter 2 is one of them. Like, why, why do the kings, you know, rebel against, I'm paraphrasing, but why do the kings of the earth rebel against themselves? And the people, they, 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 they say, let us cast off restraint. They set themselves against the Lord and against his holy one, against his anointed one. And then it goes on to say in Psalm chapter 2, don't make the son angry. You better kiss the son. In other words, you need to bow to him in reverence because the son, even in the Old Testament, is the type of Messiah that was to come. And, and it's saying that the nations are rebelling against God and against his holy anointed one because God has a plan. God has a plan for mankind, but the enemy also has a plan. It's like, oh, preacher, you give way too much credit to the enemy. Look, man, you think what you want. I know what the Lord showed me, and that's what I'm going to preach. I'm here to tell you that we got a formidable foe, my friend. Now, the good news is this, is that he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And in Luke chapter 10, he said, I've given you power to tread on scorpions and serpents. He wants to give you and I authority over the works of evil. What does that even mean? He doesn't want you to be in bondage. He doesn't want your territorial area, the person that is known as Matt, to be under the bondage and the influence of demonic spirits so that he can't walk in freedom and liberty upon this earth and tell people the good news of Jesus. Jesus wants to set you free so that you and I can walk in liberty and victory so that we can be a testimony Amen. to this world around us. Because why? God wants people to come out from amongst them, God wants people to come out of her, my children. That's what it says in Revelation 18 when it's talking about financial Babylon. There's coming a day when it's all coming down, my friend. He said, come out of her. Come out of mystery Babylon. Come out of all the false religion and all the false doctrine. Come out of all of this world system that's been enticing you and pulling you. And so that's the book of Daniel is God's judgment on human government. But specifically the beast system. And this chapter, it happened then. It's a narrative, right? But it illustrates prophetically what is to come in the end. That's what I want you to see. That's, I know that that's how I study the Bible. Some people might think that I go a little too far. I don't think I do because this is the thing. Have you ever seen a musical genius? Have you ever seen an author that's a genius that can write things? I've heard music. I've heard lyrics connected. And I'm just like, oh my God. How in the world? Okay. Authors that use allegory and yeah. metaphors and all kinds of language skills. And it's like, man, dude, that was so good. How did they do that? What they've been gifted. Okay, well, do you think that God can't do that? And that's the point that I'm trying to make. If he's over here communicating something, I'm here to tell you. I have discovered in the word of God that there's layer upon layer. Dude, right. you, the more you peel it back, the, it's like, oh my goodness. You mean to tell me I read the Bible five times and I never even saw that one. Because the word of God is alive and it's powerful. Right. And, and it's ever living. Amen. You'll never exhaust it, my friend. Amen. The enemy will try to convince you that you have all year. Let me just stop. All right. So this chapter happened then, but it illustrates prophetically what is to come in the end, or at least pieces of it. Show us a glimpse. Specifically, the beast or the Antichrist is going to take over the world both slowly and methodically, but also suddenly, and his attempt to destroy the people of God. So now let's go back to this verse of scripture. It said, in the third year of this reign, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came unto Jerusalem, and he besieged it. 
It's important for us to understand that this king, he was conquering the whole known world. You, you understand that? And when I mean by the known world, I'm not trying to get overly technical on you, but look, the Phoenician people on the Mediterranean coast, they made shipways and ship routes. But before people explored the seas, nobody knew how to ship from sea to sea. Uh, you know, the, the Roman people made roads that were more easy to travel until the Romans made roads that traveled across all the way from the west to the east. They didn't know how far the world was. And, I did, and the reason that we're getting a glimpse of what's going on is because this is a narrative about God's people. And God wants his people, whether it was then or today, to know what's up. Can I say it like that? God wants you and I to know what's up. He wants us to be prepared for what happened then so that we can understand. Listen, this is really not the greatest of theology right here, but I love it. And so you're just going to have to bear with my silliness. Tomater. Y'all ever heard of Tomater before? The cars, the junkyard dog, got a guy, Tomater, and he always drove backwards. And he said, I'm the best backwards driver in the whole wide world. And I had a sticker on my car that they gave me whenever one time, and it said, Tomater was what it said. I don't need to know where I'm going because I know where I've been. He was always looking up ahead from where he had come. And you know, there's, a, there's some truth to that. If you don't know anything about the past, if you don't know anything about the history, how in the world are you going to know anything about the future? No, there's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said. What happened then, and I'm telling you, according to the word of God, what happened then is going to happen again. And we and the Lord is giving us clues and pictures within the word of God. And especially even that's why we're going to take our time. We're going to move through. But in this chapter right here, I'm seeing clues. This isn't apocalyptic. This is narrative. But even within the narrative, God is wanting to expose some things. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he came unto Jerusalem and he besieged it. So this is this is the known world at the time. But what we're seeing is a glimpse of God's people. We're being given the picture of how this conquest affected God's people because this is God's word and God wants his people again to understand what's going on, whether it's in the past, the present, or what will come in the future. That's what the book of Revelation describes that it wants to do. But I want you to understand something. He besieged them. Suddenly, everything changed. I want you to imagine that. I'm not trying to say that coronavirus is, that's not, I'm just trying to make a point. Did the world change with coronavirus to some extent? Yeah. We don't know what we don't know what tomorrow holds. I'm not going to sit here for some doomsday prophet that don't know. But what I'm trying to say is, do you realize how fast our life changed after 9/11, after coronavirus? Look, I could sit here and start spitting off all kind of conspiracy theories that I don't just know that there's so much of a theory. But I'm not going to do that. I want to stick to the Word of God. Now. <laughs> Suddenly, everything changed. I want you to imagine that you're Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want you to imagine you're 15, 16, or 17 years old, and you're out there on the streets of Jerusalem minding your own business. And then all of a sudden, somebody up on the wall blows the shofar. Ba -ba! Ba -ba! It's a warning. It's a convocation. Sound the alarm. Sound the trumpet in Zion. There's a problem. They're besieging the city. It means to surround it and to begin to choke it like a snake. Begin to just choke the life out. They surround it, man. There ain't nothing coming in. There ain't nothing going out. Oh, that little secret pool that Hezekiah had built that brought some water in from the outside of the city. That's only going to last so long, my friend. He was smart, but look, it ain't going to last you forever. He's going to choke you out. And ultimately, I want you to just imagine that. So, because I tried to do some math on this one time, and the distance from Jerusalem to Babylon is about what it is to go from here to San Antonio. You imagine walking that road, my friend, <laughs> under chains and shackles and whatever the case, traveling that journey when everything was normal. Everything was normal. Everything was going just fine. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. Now, I want you to remember Babylon, because as we move forward in the next chapter, it's going to talk about this head of gold being Babylon. I want you to remember Babel. I want you to remember the origination of the mysteries of, of, of the mystery religions of Babylon. But he came in and he besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. You know, that's one thing I want you to see, too. Look at this. It says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim. That's God's king right there. The Lord gave him. What we always got to understand is, is that when things change on the earth, 
We may not understand why God is allowing or when things change in our life. We may not understand why God is allowing, but, it, but God is sovereign and in control, my friend. And nothing takes him by surprise. The word of God says, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Look at this. Part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar. You may not remember, but the land of Shinar is all that area in that valley between those two rivers where I normally draw, draw between the Euphrates and the Tigris River, our, modern day Iraq, the whole Babylonian empire where Nimrod started the plain of Shinar. So all this, now this is 500, you know, this is several hundreds of years later after Nimrod, but nevertheless, I just wanted, I want to make that connection. So we're talking about the vessels and he took those vessels that belonged to God's house and he brought it to the house of his God and he brought the vessels into the treasure of the house of his God. Now, I want two things that stick out. Look at this. He also took certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed. Two things that stick out to me are the vessels of the temple and the king's seed. And what I want you to know is this. I, I'm using this typologically, but those vessels, we don't have time to break down all the instrumentation and all the vessels that were utilized for temple worship. We've taught on that before, the tabernacle, the temple. But listen, just to do sacrifices, you had an altar, but you had you had to take be able, you had to have shovels with fire pans so you could get the coals from the altar of sacrifice to put it in the fire pan so that the priest could bring it into the holy place so that it could put the coals on the altar of incense so that it could take a spoon to scoop the incense on the altar of incense. And they had all these different kind of vessels, cups, and all kinds of things to drink out of so that they could put, they could put a, a hint of wine, you know, and they could pour it on the sacrifice as a drink offering. All these were types and shadows of Jesus in his offering and also types and shadows of believers and how they were, they were going to worship the Lord as they put their faith in Christ. And all of these articles and vessels were, were, were types of God's plan for his people to worship him. That was in the old covenant and that came and it was fulfilled in Jesus. But what I want you to know is that's what they took. When it says they took the vessels, they took the articles that belong to, to, for God's worship, for his people to be able to worship him. And they also took the king's seed. The, who are you? You're the seed of the king. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that it happened literally then, and in my opinion, this is what we're going to see as we get closer and closer to the end. The enemy wants to come in and he wants to besiege Jerusalem. The word Jerusalem means peace. The enemy wants to come in and he wants to surround believers. He wants to surround the people of God and he wants to begin to choke them out. And he wants to begin to cause them to compromise according to the ways of the world. Because if he can get you and I to start compromising today, oh Lord, help us, my friend, whenever we get to tomorrow. Because if, you're, if you and I are compromising today, it's going to be so much easier to compromise tomorrow. You know, we need to remember that Satan already has the world, but what he really, really, really wants is to hurt God. And how do you hurt a parent that's stronger than you? You start affecting his children. <coughs> the enemy wants to attack God's children. I just want you to rem be reminded of the, that Nebuchadnezzar in this story is a type of Antichrist. He's the king of Babylon, which is the original point of the mystery Babylon, which is the name given by God of the beast system that has been casting a spell over humanity for thousands of years. This man, king, the Antichrist, will besiege I believe that he's going to besiege the majority of the whole world. He will demand allegiance to him. He will want more than anything to take the vessels, the people that belong to God and allow God's worship, the articles of the temple. He will want the seeds, the offspring of the king, and he will want all of that to be brought under his rule. And he will want the people of God to serve him because he will want God's people to worship. Now, I want you to see here in. Verses 4 through 7, the plan of the enemy was to nourish or educate God's people according to the Babylonian ways. He says, he, it says it right here. This is the people he wanted, the people that had understanding, science. That was what Daniel was. Man, Daniel was one of these kids in school, man. He, he slammed a physics test. Calculus, <laughs> you give it to him. He was, that, that's the kind of kids these were. These were the cream of the crop, man. These, these, these young people had been trained. In the ways of their God. Alright. 
<laughs> he wanted them to, to, to learn the ways of the Babylonian Empire so that they could serve him. Now, look, I, I got it in my notes somewhere, but I just want to make a practical point. The way life is today, you and I are citizens of America, right? That's what you and I are. There's people that are citizens of Mexico, but we're ultimately first citizens of the kingdom of God. Right. And what God would want you and I to do, in, as the spirit lives on the inside of us, he would want us to be the best citizens wherever we're living that we could possibly be because it brings glory to God. And there's truth that as we take a stand for the ways of God in this practical aspect that we live in, that many times we see promotion in our life. I'm not trying to get ahead of myself, but I know I'm ahead of my notes. But listen, there's coming a day. Jesus said, work while it is day because the night comes when no man will work. There's coming a time when there's, and what I'm trying to say is this, and whether you're pre-trip and mid-trip, and like, let me just say this right now. This is my disclaimer. I'm not going to keep repeating. I'm not trying to convince anybody to believe anything that I believe. I'm just over here trying to unfold the scriptures, and in the end, you're going to still believe whatever you want to believe, and I'm just going to encourage you and give you knuckle bumps that we all love each other, because <laughs> that we all love each other, and that, but let, me, but let me just say this thing one time, and I'm going to try not to say this again. If the pre-trip position is right, right, and that, and that we're raptured out of here before anything really bad at all starts to happen, you ain't got, we ain't got nothing to worry about, That's right? Right? We ain't got nothing at all to worry about. Boom, out of here, and we're good to go. But if by some chance you, we, you and I were so convinced that that pre-tribulation picture was right, that we never even entertained the scriptures from any other perspective, Lord, help you. Lord, help me. Because, you see, you wouldn't have even been interested. Oh, here he goes again with all that stuff. I'm tuning him out. La, 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 la. And the sad thing is, you wouldn't have even needed it until you really needed it. And when you really needed it, I'm not saying it was too late, but it had been a whole lot better had you paid attention yeah. whenever it was coming for you. Yep. Because, why? How is that even going to help a believer at that point in time? I'm going to tell you how. Because you'd been prepared. Right. Your heart was prepared. Your mind was prepared. And you prayed and you said, Lord, help me not to compromise. Help me to be a Daniel and not to compromise when I, in, in these times, Lord. And help me to be able to see clearly whenever the, what, what's happening in the world around me, Lord. Because listen to me, we don't even have time to get into how bad it's going to be. Not right now, not tonight. But I'm telling you right now, if it doesn't go down the way many a preacher has said, it's going to be a whole world of hurting. And there's going to be many a Christian. You want to talk about a falling away? You want to talk about a defection from the faith? That's right. How? All those preachers told me one thing and it was something completely different. How could God do this to me? God didn't do nothing to you. The word of God was right here. We're going to break it down. We're going to dissect it. And every single time I come across a verse that looks like it could lend itself towards pre-trip, you don't think I'm going to gloss over it, do you? I'm going to point it out, and we're going to go through, and we're going to do it the right way. And then whenever I see other things that show something else, we're going to point it out. We're going to go through, and in the end, again, you're going to have the information, right? And you're going to pray, and you're going to seek the face of God. And hopefully... We'll either be with the Lord through the rapture before we got to see any of this stuff, or we'll go to sleep in Christ, and we'll wake up in glory, and we won't have to deal with any of that. But if you did, you're going to want to have the same grace that Paul had when he got his head cut off under Nero, yeah. under Emperor Nero. You're going to want to have the same grace that Mark had when they tied him to the back of a chariot and drug him through the streets of Egypt. You're going to want to have, all they had to do was say, oh, no, I, I changed my mind. It's not really real. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I was just joking. No, no, no. Jesus didn't raise from the dead. I was just saying that. I didn't mean it. No. Because in the end, he's going to demand allegiance. Okay. And so, wanted to know who they could teach the, uh, the tongue of the Chaldeans. And look at this. This is, the, this is one of the main points that I wanted to make tonight. Wanted to appoint them a portion of the king's food. So the king, just think about this. So everything's normal life, and then all of a sudden, in one day, everything changes. Just like that. And they bring you under the dominion of a leader that really, as long as you do what he wants you to do, it's okay. But if you don't do what he wants you to do, it's about to get ugly. And we're going to see that in the next few chapters coming up. It's about to get real ugly up in this place if you don't do what he's telling you to do. And part of what they want you to do is they want to give you a provision of the king's meat. Okay. What's interesting to me is, is that whenever I looked up 
uh, one of these words here about having to do with the, no, the nourishing. That's what it was. This word nourishing. The idea had to describe growing, but it also described uh, teaching to do great things. But it, but it was also talking about increasing in understanding and knowledge. And so whenever you nourish someone in the way, and that's what he was wanting to do. He was wanting to prepare them to be able to receive the instruction of the Babylonians so that they would be indoctrinated to their ways. And what I'm trying to say is that that's what happened then. I believe that's what's going to happen in the future. And we got New Testament passages of Scripture that are going to straight up say that that's exactly what's going to happen. Where the Antichrist is going to demand that people come under his influence and under his ways. And so he said, and this is what you need to drink, and this is what you need to eat. But the word of God says, so that you can stand before the king. Now, you know, how I like that word stand right there because in the New Testament it has one meaning, but right here it's something a little different. In the book of Ephesians, the word stand means to take your stand against the forces of evil. To stand in the faith. To stand in the face of. But right here it's talking about you're going to stand before the king because you're serving him. You've been brought before him and now you've got to stand in his presence. And so we, we hear the story. But, Dan, but look at this. So, so all of these people are being told what they're going to eat. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. <laughs> Praise God. Daniel purposed in his heart. That he would not defile himself. He set his mind yeah. right. He prepared his heart. Yeah. He had the right mindset. He said, no, 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 no. You're going to, look, it ain't happening, my friend. Listen, he said, I'm not going to compromise. Now, he did it much, he, he definitely, like, did it in a very kind and a humble way. We read the story. But he did it nonetheless. He said, won't you just test me? And we're going to get into that in a second. Won't you put us to the test? Just prove us in this situation. But I'm not. I'm not going to eat this food. Now, listen. The dietary laws of the children of Israel regarding clean and unclean animals and what they could eat and what they could drink was all spiritually connected. That which is clean or that which is unclean, there's so much spiritual understanding connected to all that with different kinds of mixtures and the certain things that the other animals would eat. And all of that is interconnected to things that have to do with demonic forces and things of the world that are not of the Lord that, that contaminate the children of God. And that's basically what they were wanting them to do. They were wanting them to eat things that God had told them not to. But there's so much spiritual truth connected to all that. Like in other words, if... We're here and the world changes overnight and that the inner, you, you, you're supposed to be a good American citizen. But as soon as the laws of the land start to try to supersede the law of God and start to tell you, oh, no, it's perfectly fine for everybody to just go out and, 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 and get as drunk, snotty drunk as what they want to and do whatever that they want to do. But that's not what the word of God says. Oh, no, it's perfectly fine. We're going to introduce a new form of worship and, you know. Kind of like it was in the old days when I had some temple prostitutes and you know, no, that's fine. You can do that now. What? Because man changed laws? Wait, hold on a second. That's not what the word of God said. Oh no, it's perfectly fine, man. You can be a Rastafarian Christian church and you can smoke weed in your services. Wait, hold on a second. What? But that but that kind of stuff's going on today. And people pretend in their mind that it's okay and that it's justifiable. Like even what we're gonna do whenever they legalize marijuana. Is everybody that's now a born-again Christian that the Lord showed them that it was wrong to smoke weed? Now that it's not against the law anymore, all of a sudden all the Christians are going to start smoking weed? Because the law of man said it was okay? And now everybody's driving around like obliterated and in another world and everything's all foggy and they can't even, well man, Jesus is so groovy and you can't even learn? You can't even be sober-minded? That's what I'm trying to say. Just because the king said it was okay to eat this meat, Daniel said, no, I purpose in my heart. I got my mindset right. I'm not going to eat what it is that you're offering me. Now, listen, again, at this time frame, Daniel taking the stand and believing, he gets elevated. As we move forward in the story, Daniel gets elevated in this kingdom. But I got to tell you something. In the very end, it ain't going to be that way. If we're still around to face some of the persecution that's coming, and it's already coming. We're just living the, the life of Riley in America. Listen, the Indian people are giving their life up right now. The Syri Syrian people are giving their life up right now. 
We're just over here living the, the life of luxury of America, but that don't mean it's going to stay that way until the end. I'm just saying. I'm just getting, re getting you ready. You do what you want with that. So, many times people want to eat what they want to eat, though, right? And, and in Numbers, for the sake of time, I'm not even going to turn there, but in Numbers, the Lord said, if that's what you choose to eat, if that's what you want to eat, I'm going to give it to you till it's loads them to you, till it comes out your nostrils. John, Jesus said that I'm the bread of life. Amen. And, and listen, eating clean versus unclean spiritual food. Timothy warned us that in the end days there would be doctrines of devils. He's talking about people feeding themselves spiritual counterfeit food. He said that versus the doctrines of gods and first do doctrines of God in first Timothy 416. Second Thessalonians two and three talks about a falling away. Apostasia, falling away. 2 Thessalonians 2 7, it says that the mystery of iniquity is working. I'm trying to say that this king was trying to get Daniel to eat something that was unclean and bad for him. And that we're warned in the New Testament that, that there is a, there's false doctrine and counterfeit spirits that are trying to teach people to eat spiritual food that will that will cause a delusion, cause Cause, cause a confusion over their hearts and minds that they would be led astray. I believe that's the five unwise virgins. Right. It's not that they didn't love God. They didn't have the truth. They had gone off on a different path. And ultimately, the plan of the king was to indoctrinate these people and to send them in the wrong direction. And once they were properly indoctrinated and prepared, they would stand before the king. Now let's go ahead and go to verses in verse 8 through 11. He, you know, again, Daniel purposed in his heart. He didn't want to be nursed the way everyone else it, it was. You know, and let me just say this. If you'll remember one of the spots whenever we read it, it said, what happened in the end? Daniel said, don't feed us the food that all those other ones are eating. Boy. Hmm. Because listen, those other ones, you know who they were? They were the children of Israel. They were all locked up in there together, whatever it looked like. And some of them were Hebrew children. It was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the four that said, no, we're not going to eat it. And the rest of them ate it. I'm like, I ain't telling that king I ain't going to eat his food. Come over here. Hey, when in, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. They're not going to know what we're doing over there in Jerusalem, man. We're over here now. We're in Babylon. Live like the Romans, baby. Do, do, do what they do. You know? No, that's not ever okay. That's not all right. That's right. Compromise is not okay. You know, one of the things that, you know, listen, Daniel took a stand. You know, this is what Angie was preaching the other day when she preached her pea patch. That's what this is. Daniel stood in the pea patch. You're not going to have this. This belongs to the Lord. I'll fight for this pea patch. Till there ain't nothing left. Till, the, till you drain the blood out of me. I know one thing. God told me not to do this. But listen. Once you compromise. Once my friend. It gets easier. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You ever watched an MMA fight before? This might be a bad illustration. But I've seen some crazy MMA fights. Where some of these guys got blood. Like their whole body's covered in blood. And it's in the fifth round. Five, uh, five minute rounds. And they ain't got nothing left. But they're not stopping. They're not quitting. And I'm talking about cuts. It's just the most disgusting thing you've ever seen. It's like, dude, just quit. Like, you could have quit three rounds ago and everybody would have understood. It would have been okay. You no, know, really, you proved yourself to the whole world. You're like the toughest man ever. To, like, nobody ever seen that like this. No, I ain't gonna quit. I'm not gonna quit. Cause if I, listen, if you quit the first time, it becomes easier to quit the next time. And, you know, sometimes I'm watching some of these things, like even recently, sometimes they'll be, they'll see the other guy and it's like all of his energy is right here in his chest. He's, he can't even catch his breath. He can't, he's so fatigued and his, and his opponent will point to him and smile. He's like, ah, yeah, you're about to quit. You're already thinking in your mind. You're trying to think of all the different ways that you can quit. And you can get yourself out of this situation. And, and, and he is. The opponent. He's, and it's hard for him to catch his breath. And he feels fatigued. And he just keeps getting pounded. And it would just be so much easier if I just quit right now. Because I can always come back another day. No, no, no. Yes, it's true. You can always come back another day. But the first time you quit. The first time you compromise. 
it becomes easier to compromise. Listen to me, child of God. I'm not trying to tell you if you messed up yesterday that you can't make it come back. That's not what I'm trying to say. There's always another, as long as you got breath in your lungs, amen, there's always another day for the Lord to lift you back up. But listen, if you think that you and I can continue to live a life of compromise and the Lord's going to be okay with it, no, God's not okay with that. At some point in time, the message of the cross is supposed to translate into a reality of our life, a reality of the way that we live our life, amen, to where we don't compromise with the ways of the world, with the king of Babylon, but instead we only hold true to the word of the Lord and we protect that pea patch of faith that he gave to us. Daniel stood, his friends stood, and listen, because they stood today, it became easier to stand when he got a hold of him. Daniel goes into the lion's den. The three boys, they go into a fiery furnace, but they took the stand. Amen? And I got to just encourage you this tonight, I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. That we need to not compromise. The Lord, help us not compromise. Right. Amen. So that, so that when we stand today, amen, we'll have the grace and the strength that we need to stand even whenever it gets even harder. Amen. amen. And then he goes on to say this, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and close here in a moment. But in verse 12, he this word right here, prove. He said, prove your servant. In other words, you know what he was saying there? Put us to the test. Now, you know what's interesting is when he says right here, put your servants to the test, I beg of you, for 10 days. He recommended 10 days. Now, I got to tell you that Daniel would have understood Leviticus chapter 23. All right, now, I'm not, I could go off on this and keep you here till. 8.30, but I'm not going to do it. We've taught about the festivals before. i got to even be careful. I don't even open that up too much. But I just want you to know I'm just going to focus on one festival. It's in the seventh month of Tishri. The number seven is the number of completion. It's the number of rest. Why? But why is it rest? Because God finished his work. And so he rested. It's the, it means the work is completed. I wish that I had time to really teach this right now, but in the first month, the first four feasts were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. Feast of Unleavened Bread, Passover, Feast of First Fruits. He resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits in the day of Pentecost. All four of those happened the first time he came. Am I trying to tell you that all three are going to happen in the second time? Yeah, kind of, sort of. That's what I'm thinking. Why would he put it like that if it wasn't? Anyway, the first one is the Feast of Trumpets. On the first day... This is Leviticus chapter 23. On the first day of the seventh month, you're to blow the trumpet. And then you blow successive trumpets for the next 10 days. Because on the 10th day, it's the day of atonement. Which is the day that they bring the blood into the Holy of, Holy of Holies. For those 10 days, it doesn't say it in the Bible. But if you do some extra biblical research, there's something called the 10 days of awe. For 10 days after that first trumpet is blown, there's this period of time that gives you the opportunity to get your heart and your life right before the Day of Atonement comes. It was a, it was a way to sober up the children of Israel. It's a testing period. It's a time frame where the children of Israel were called for the days of all to really circumspectly consider their own hearts and their own lives. Amen? Do we do? I don't know if you do that enough. I don't think... Do, do we ever do that enough to where we really circumspectly look at our own lives? I mean, it's so easy to get caught up in everybody else and what everybody else is doing and how everybody else is wrong. But are we looking at our own life? Right. Amen? Okay. Ten days of the days of all. And I've just noticed that he said that about ten days. But listen, there's also another scripture out of, out of the book of Revelation chapter 2. And it's talking to the church of Thyatira. And, he, and he, this is what he says. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go to that one. Revelation chapter 2, and I believe it was verse, I think it was verse 20. I'm sorry, it's Revelation 2, 8. 2, 8 and 10. So we're talking about the end days. Look what it says. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things, says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty. 
but you are rich. So the world might see you as poor, but the word of God says you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which call themselves Jews, and they are not, but they are instead of the synagogue of Satan. I wish we had time to get into that. We will one day. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. So I just want you to see the common, the commonality. Now, whoever this is speaking to, whenever we get into the book of Revelation and we get into the whole tribute rapture thing more deeply, we'll look into some of that. But nevertheless, this is definitely being spoken to God's people. And this is actually during the church age. And he's saying, this is what he says, be thou faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. How, how else you break that down, my friend? And you know, one of the things that has always bothered me about this American gospel, if I'm allowed to say that, because ain't nobody filling up a church like this to hear no message like this. They're probably clicking off on Facebook. If we even had 10 on there, we're probably down to two for sure. Hmm. And all I'm trying to say is nobody really wants to hear that kind of preaching. But what I'm trying to get across to you and to them and anybody that's willing to listen is, who do we think we are in this American mindset and American gospel that says we weren't going to have to endure anything when, again, Mark got dragged through the streets of Egypt, Thomas got rammed through with an Indian sword, Paul got his head cut off. How, how, how does that work? Syrian Christians today are dying. People in Pakistan die. You can't even say you're a Christian in Saudi Arabia. They'll cut your head off. How does that work? It's not even logical. I mean, am, I, am I telling the truth or am I just like going off on a rant? I mean, maybe both. <laughs> but, but my point is, is that you get the point I'm trying to make. Ten days of all. All right. All right. I'm about to close with this. I didn't get through everything I wanted to, but that's okay. I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be careful. I don't want to overdo you. All right. God gives them gifts at the end. He gave them, look at what it says. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill Amen. and all learning yeah. and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding yeah. and all visions and dreams. God wants to give his people the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God wants yeah. to allow us to see into the supernatural. He wants us to allow yes. us to be able to yes. see into the spiritual. Yes. The way that God has gifted me, I believe, and others much more greatly than me, but to see things in the Word of God. God's called me to be a teacher, to try to dissect it, to break it down, and to try to give it to others. Amen. And at the same time, sometimes the Holy Spirit will move on somebody else and they'll give a word in tongues with a word of interpretation that meets that person right there where they are. We want the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom right. and understanding. Right. We want to have visions. We want to dream dreams. I know I do. I want to be able to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. I want to have my eyes open and my ears open. I want my heart to be prepared. Amen. For the time that we would be able to see soberly. I don't know about you, but the word of God says to be sober for your adversary. The devil roams around like a roaring lion right. seeking whom he may devour. Paul said that those that get drunk, get drunk in the night. Those that sleep, they sleep in the night that we're to be sober because our salvation is nearer now than when we first began. Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you'd help us, Lord. Pray that you'd give us wisdom, Lord God, and understanding. We pray that you'd give us your Holy Spirit to give us strength, Lord, that we would be like Daniel and not compromise. That we'd be like the other Hebrew boys and that we wouldn't compromise, but that we would take our stand in Christ and that we would receive the victorious power of the Holy Ghost because Jesus purchased it on the cross. And that we would be able to walk, Lord God, a life of, that doesn't compromise but takes a stand, oh Lord. And that whenever the times get tough, Lord God, that we'd be able to continue to take our stand. Lord God, you lead us and guide us in all truth. Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, and in, until that day comes, whatever it looks like, Lord, that you would use us like you use yes. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yes. that you would give us gifts, Lord God, that you would give us a mouthpiece yes. to speak forth the truth, Lord, to those that are in darkness, Lord, yes. so that you could set them free, so that they could also have a testimony, Lord, that would bring you glory and honor, that you would be magnified upon this earth, oh Lord God, and that others would be able to enter into yes. the eternal family of yes. God. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We pray for the congregation, for those that watch. Maybe there's somebody that watched tonight and you say, I don't even know what you're talking about. I've never received 
Jesus as my Lord and Savior right now, I would encourage you to invite him into your heart. To say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. If you believe that, if you believe it in your head, say, but I want you in my heart, Lord. I want you to come into my heart and I want you to forgive me of my sins. And let me tell you something, my friend. If you will pray that prayer, believing the Lord will change you and he will set you free. The spirit of God will come resident on the inside of your heart. He will make your heart his home. And today will be the first day of a new life for you. Lord, we pray that you would save souls, Lord, that you would make disciples, Lord God, and that you would give your soldiers victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.